would like you all to take just a brief moment and imagine something with me. I would like you to picture the things that scare you the most. Now, for some of you, you're making a list, and it might have snakes, spiders, public speaking like giving a TED Talk, maybe dinner with your in-laws, or a host of other very scary things. What usually does not make this list, but oftentimes will when I ask you to consider it, is this word, fundraising. Right? And what's not to be terrified? This idea of either asking somebody for or being asked of to give money. It's frightening. People are so scared of this word. word. I actually think that Navy SEALs should incorporate this into their resistance and grit training because it's so incredibly terrifying and we all look like this. (laughs) And it is scary. And I found it absolutely terrifying. And so in my early 20s, I started getting involved with nonprofit causes, the things that really mattered to me, the things that I cared about. And at the core of every single one of them was this issue of money. And how are we going to fund this thing? After all, if there's no money, there's no mission. This led to a position where I now work at a forward-thinking institute where we have a lab where we work with hundreds of charitable organizations to address this challenge and other ones. And so I'm going to walk you through an idea that fundraising, although it seems terrifying, is actually transformative. And so I invite you to come with me on this journey, and we're going to cover this very scary topic through three lenses, consumption, contribution, and community. And we're going to look at these each as a chapter that will reveal a story at the end, starting with consumption. Currently, we consume twice as many material goods today as we did 50 years ago. Additionally, there are 300,000 items in the average American home. There are even some estimates like that from Annie Leonard that 99% of the stuff that we purchase is trashed within just six months. And what's at the heart of this consumption? What's driving part of this? Well, what I believe it to be is comparison. Because after all, if you have, shouldn't I have? And then if we both have, isn't that now the standard by which all of us should have? Doesn't that set the lens of the means of which we think that life should now be established for us? And this leads us to a mindset of observe and obtain. You know, their living room set, that electronic. Observe and then we need to obtain it. And something interesting about this comparison is recently Facebook was linked to depression. And no fault of this great social media tool, but rather how we're using it. When you're scrolling scores of images of your friends looking like they're living these amazing, beautiful lives, how can this not help to stir feelings inside of yourself that maybe I don't have everything I should have like they have? And right now, one out of every 10 Americans rents off-site storage. So now that we're over the 300,000 items that we can fit in the average American home, we actually need to go out and buy additional storage for more stuff to put it in. And if you're fortunate to be a top income earner, some of you just buy another house in another location where you spend just a few months, which also has an additional 300,000 items in it. (laughs) And we're in this circle of compare and consume, compare and consume. And we really want to try to buy just about anything. But the thing that we can't buy is happiness. See, all of these things you can buy. Right now, some of you, by the way, have a robot that's cleaning your vac- or vacuuming your floor, and you're not even there to witness it. You can order snow off the internet if you want it shipped to you. You can even walk through the Mall of America and rent the space to take a nap. <laughs> But what we can't buy is happiness. But this does not stop us from trying. Right now, we are spending a fortune on trying to find happiness, and we are becoming less happy in the process. In fact, the systematic packaging and selling of happiness is an industry estimated to be worth more than $10 billion, which is about the same size as Hollywood. 
and we are just driven to consume. In the book, Happiness Hypothesis, the author lays out a really eloquent example of our emotions and our mind. And he gives us this metaphor that our emotions are like an elephant and our mind is like the writer. And so we're in this trap of looking to say, that watch or that car or the way their life is structured is something we need. And after all, I can't make it through Christmas if I don't get this tickle me Elmo. Things are going to fall apart. And living in this age of consumption, which, by the way, is unprecedented because there's no time in history where there has been more money spent to try to capture your attention. Even right now, all of you have a little square in your pocket that is staying warm, ready to capture your attention and possibly try to get you to consume something in the next few minutes or whenever you're ready. And because we live in this age, Wisdom is coming from really interesting and profound places. Like Jim Carrey, the 21st century philosopher, (laughs) who says, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they've ever dreamed of so they can see that that's not the answer. You see, these are part of the equation, but they're meant to play harmony, not to be the bass note. That's your soul. And what's happened is we're trying to consume our way to happiness. But you really can't get there. However, there is something called the fulfillment curve. And this lays out a very interesting case for us to examine. Is that when you go from survival to enough, your happiness will go up. Of course it will. When you're not worried about what to eat, what shelter you're going to stay at tonight, what's going to happen to you tomorrow, when you start to feel safe, when you reach enough, which is subjective to you, by the way, this point of enough. But when we go from survival to enough, our fulfillment and our happiness goes up. But something interesting happens when we pass this point of enough and we continue to consume. And what happens is we get into overconsumption and our fulfillment starts to go down our happiness begins to plummet. And right now, to put this into perspective, Americans spend $1.2 trillion annually on non-essential goods. So things that are past the point of what be enough for most of us. And we continue to consume. Right now, I've taken to a non-scientific experience Uh, our experiment of watching just the trash in my back alley, which is only about five houses. And it is alarming that most days, some of us can't even shut the trash can. (laughs) And we're continuing to consume. And these non-essential items, again, with over 90% of them potentially being thrown away in the first six months to also quantify the stuff that we're buying that's not staying. Let's also just take a look at what enough might mean for the rest of the world who currently lives on $2.50 a day. Over 3 billion people live on less than $2.50 a day. So let's shift our lens and move to the second Um, lends to contribution, the second chapter in our stories. Because I have good news for you, my friends, my fellow do-gooders and soon-to-be do-gooders, is that the good news that I bring to you is that we are hardwired for giving. Not only is this just a good concept, but this, this is not an empty theology. This isn't just an idea. This is actually scientists saying that we are encoded with DNA that allows us to survive because we are cooperating, because we give. When you give, really interesting things happen neurologically. It actually activates the mesiolimbic pathway, which you know releases dopamine. And this neurotransmitter regulates the brain center for joy and pleasure. So we really are wired for this. And though we seek to get this pleasure from other things, I would suggest to you that perhaps instead of continuing to overconsume, that if you added contributing in, 
we can stop this arc of overconsumption leading to emptiness and start to experience greater fulfillment. Because you have a choice to be part of this good story or you have a choice to be part of this consumption story. And the great thing is, there's been some really, really interesting things that have happened around this subject. Some scientists have gotten involved, researchers done, Atkin and Norkin did a study where they gave a sum of money to participants and they asked them to make a choice. Spend this money on themselves or spend it on somebody else, essentially. And those that chose to give it to somebody else or to help a charity, something good, they reported satisfaction and joy went up. Their happiness actually went up. And that was regardless of income or the amount given. So for some of us who buy the lie that we shouldn't participate because we really can't make a difference, it's not just about moving the needle forward for that cause. It's also about who you are and the base note that you're following. Because if we are the type of people that don't give, we are now non-givers. But if we choose to give, this opens up a better path for all of us. And there's more good news, is that giving actually helps others to live longer. When you contribute your time, talent, or treasure, you are really telling somebody that they, are, that they matter. And these health benefits are really astounding. One of the top five factors contributing to lower depression rates is giving to neighbors and communities. Creativity, meaning, resilience, health, and even longevity can all be enhanced or be a byproduct of contributing to the lives of others. And that is according to Dr. Post at Stony Brook University School of Medicine. You are happier and healthier when you contribute. And the science is clear that when you contribute, your happiness goes up. And when you are happy, you contribute more. Part of my work entails working with a lot of young leaders. And young leaders are currently really trying to find purpose. Just a generalization. One quick note to find purpose. Look at the things that you have solved in your life, that you have found a solution for, that you've overcome, and turn around and help somebody else with that same challenge. It releases in us a beautiful story of being part of a community of givers, which brings us to our third and final chapter to this story is community. For what's happening when you decide to support a charity or you decide to help a neighbor in need? To quote Pat Trainer from Dakota Medical Foundation, when you support a charity, you are telling someone they matter. You are easing pain you are inspiring dreams, and sometimes you are saving lives. See, this terrifying work of fundraising is not at all what people think it is. Because of our consumer culture, we're so focused on money that that's the thing that we gravitate to. But this work of supporting charities and helping charities and being a contributor and also being part of a fundraising team is that it's about meaning and it's not about money. See, there is the structure of the thing and the spirit of the thing. The structure is the words we use to try to quantify something. What is it? How does it work? How do we do it? The spirit is the base note that's underneath all of that structure. And so the language doesn't fit. My friends and I could spend countless hours talking about if this should even be called nonprofits or charities or if it should be social purpose. But really what we're trying to do is just aptly name the spirit which is underneath all of this, which is meaning. See, because this work, when I say fundraising, the images that conjure up are sitting in front of somebody and trying to convince them. But this work is not about convincing, it's about connecting. It's not about face-to-face sales pushing It's about side by side painting a purpose, a compelling purpose, and we discuss ideas side by side together. And so we can work together to say, what can we do to move the needle forward in these important issues? Let's get our talented friends together and start drawing up blueprints. Let's start to see that these are not about transactions, but they are about transformations. 
And see, if you're a donor and you are terrified of being asked in here, I encourage you to embrace your no so you can empower your yes. It's your map to draw. It's for you to set that journey. And for my fellow fundraisers, your job is to help people to find fulfillment. That you believe that your cause is good enough for people to participate with and that you love everybody enough to give them the opportunity to participate. Jackson Brown says this, remember that the happiest people are not those getting more, but those that are giving more. So, can money buy happiness? Potentially, but not the way that we thought. The one thing that money cannot buy is authenticity. But it turns out contributing can help you find it along the way, which leads to happiness. And so our fundraisers, what are they? They are agents of significance making meaningful connections for more fulfilling lives. If you are somebody in here and you're scared to ask for money or be a part of a charitable cause because of what that entails, I will tell you three things that you can take with you. Is one, believe that you have a mission that is worth giving to. Two, know that people will give generously if asked. Not everybody, but that people will give generously if asked. And love everyone enough to give them the opportunity to give. Because for all of us that get to contribute and choose to contribute, your opportunity lies in what my good friend Paul Shervish calls a moral biography. You can shape the story that you're going to leave. Every great moral and spiritual tradition points to this, that we find ourselves by giving and participating in community. So I charge you with these three things. Choose, choose to contribute over consuming. Choose to be caring rather than critical. We have enough criticism. Instead, choose to lean into others and their cause. Be curious about how things work and if this is something that leads to fulfillment. And choose celebration over comparison. For if we do this as a community, we'll be cultivating a community of givers that is truly limitless. Thank you. Thank you.